But when 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to start there and read one verse. We're dealing with the subject, why I am still a Baptist. Amen. And I hope you know why you are. 1 Corinthians 12, again, this series has been somewhat of a teachy type series, so I hope it's been helpful to you. And I hope tonight will be as well. Amen. Verse 27, 1 Corinthians 12. Does everyone have a handout? We're good? All right. Now ye are the body of Christ, notice this phrase, and members in particular. Amen. Now ye are the body of Christ, Amen. and members in particular. Amen. It's going to be a little springboard of what we're going to look at tonight. Let's pray. Father, please help me tonight as I preach your word. I recognize that I need a fresh filling of thy spirit. I need thee this evening. Please lead and direct as I teach this and preach this subject that you'd please uh, just speak to our hearts. Perhaps it's some things we know. Perhaps it's some things we don't know tonight. But I recognize, Lord, that it's only by your spirit that anything will get accomplished this evening. So please help me, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Came across a 2017 article that was entitled this. Is church membership biblical? Now, the guy who wrote the article was kind of, I'll just go ahead and say the word. I don't know else, how else to say it. It's kind of a kook. Uh, he was saying some strange things. So I, I don't want to mention his name. But the reason I'm using this is because some of the things he wrote depicts an attitude that is held by many believers concerning local church membership. What is local church membership? Is it biblical? Now here's what he writes. Church membership, or placing your membership in a local congregation, listen to this, is a great fraud that has been cast upon God's people by so-called spiritual leaders of the institutional organized church. It has no basis whatsoever in scriptures and in fact goes contrary to scripture. He goes on to say the biblical fact is that once a person is joined to Christ, he is a full participating member of the church. Believers did not become members of anything. They did not have to become a member of what they were automatically a part of. That's interesting, isn't it? The question is, is it true? Is it true? Evidently, many believers think so. You say, why do you say that? Because according to the Hartford Institute of Religion Research, less than 20% of Americans attend any kind of church. 40% of Americans say they go to church, but when checked out, if they really do, it's found out that only 20% actually do. That's amazing. In America, 4,000 to 7,000 churches close their doors every single year, and the reason quite often is a lack of members. You know, between 2010 and 2012, more than half of all churches in America did not add one new member, not one. Nobody. More than half. No one joined the church. Barna Research tells us that there is a growing number of people who say that they love Jesus, but get this, they hate the church. That's interesting, isn't it? Jesus loves the church, amen, and gave himself for it. So again, is church membership something that we find in the Bible? If so, can you prove it? If I asked you to prove to me from the Word of God that church membership is biblical, can you do it? Well, if not, hopefully after tonight you can. Amen. Now, for several weeks now, on Wednesday evenings, we've been dealing with the subject, why, am I, why I am still a Baptist. Now, when we call ourselves Baptists, it means we believe certain things. Amen? Amen. You say, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, we call them Baptist distinctives. And we listed, of course, eight of them using the acrostic B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S -T -S as a memory tool to understand what does it mean to be a Baptist. When I say I am a Baptist, what does that mean I believe? It ought to mean I believe something. Amen. It ought to mean I have some doctrinal convictions. Amen. What are they? 
I'm not saying again, as I've said before, with this disclaimer that I agree with every Baptist church. There are many Baptist churches today that I would not attend. But what are the things that we say we believe when we say we're Baptists? Well, again, we've looked at the acrostic, and, and we've dealt with uh, five of the eight marks. Would you say them with me as for, as for memory, if you will? Letter B, what is it? Believer's baptism only. Okay, letter A, the authority and inerrancy of the Scriptures. P, the priesthood of the believer. T, two church ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then last week, I, independence and autonomy of the local church. Now tonight, let's deal with this sixth distinctive. Notice at the top of your sheet, a saved church membership. Now we could emphasize either one of those. We could emphasize the saved part or the church membership part. Both of them need to be emphasized. But tonight I'm going to lean just a little bit more so on the church membership part. Why is church membership important? Why, why is ha and then why is having a saved church membership important? Is it important for someone that's a believer to say, I am a member of the church? Is that something God wants? Amen. Well, let's find out. Let's look at it tonight. Turn over, if you will, to Acts chapter 1. Let's begin there. We're going to have a lot of scriptures, and Lord willing, I'm going to move fast tonight. Thank you for not amening that one. Number 1, Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, watch this, the number of names together were about an hundred and twenty. Number one, write this down. We're going to consider the reality of church membership. Amen. Is it a biblical reality? Now, we understand that the church began the local assembly with Christ and his disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, we have defined the local church as an organized local assembly of baptized believers voluntarily join themselves together to carry out the Great Commission. And we know that the local church is the entity through which Christ desires to do his work in this world. And that's very important to understand. This is what Christ has ordained to carry out his will in this world. 1 Timothy 3.15 calls the church the pillar and ground of the truth. So the local church is made up of people that are saved, but those also those who are not just saved, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but those who have also chosen to identify with Christ's assembly and do his work in this world, serving as a unit through his local assembly. How many are glad you're a church member tonight? Amen. Amen. Now notice in Acts chapter 1 and verse 15, after Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven, we find this first local church in this upper room. And notice what's interesting about that is that we know the number. Amen. How many were there? Say it. 120. So what does that mean when we know that they're in the upper room as Christ told them to be, and they're numbered at 120, what does that tell us? It tells us two things. Number one is this, is that the church was a distinct group. Amen. In other words, there were those who were distinctly a part of this church, and then there were those who were distinctly not a part of this church. So in other words, as we see these people, there were these 120 that were in the membership, and everybody else was out of the membership. Now this truth is displayed also, if you want to write this passage down, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. In other words, this truth that, there, that you are tonight either in the church membership, or you are out of the church membership. 1 Corinthians 5, you know the story. Here was a man committing fornication with his stepmother, and he was unrepentant. This church was being rebuked. And notice in verse, uh, let's pick it up in verse 12. For what I have I to do to judge them also, notice this phrase, that are without. Do not ye judge them that are within? 
But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So notice he describes some that are without the church, meaning they're not in the church membership. And then there's some that are within the church. That means that there are some in the church membership. So understand something, that Capital Baptist Church is a distinct group of people. If you attend this church and you're not a member, you're really not a part of Capital Baptist Church. I'm not trying to be mean, but that's the truth. You're either in the church membership or you're out of the church membership. So knowing that there was 120, that means there was this distinct group. Here they are, this 120, they are a part of this church. There's another truth, letter B, write this down, is that the church members then were also an identifiable group. So there's 120. That means they know who they were. That means that there had to be some sort of role. There had to be some sort of list. Or at least someone, some known list or record of names of those that were a part of that assembly that joined that assembly. So church members are those who voluntarily choose to be identified with the assembly and have been received into that assembly by the current members. So notice it is a known role. If you were to say, can you produce a list of Capital Baptist Church? We could. We could. We have a church role. We have a list of names. And so understand, a church member is somebody who decides, I want to join. I voluntarily want to join. But there's another side to it. It's also the church receiving them into the membership. So it's two sides. There's a desire to join, and then there's a desire to receive them into the membership, making that person an identifiable member of Capital Baptist Church. Now let's look at some places. Go to Acts 2. Back to Acts 2. Because we're going to see some examples of this idea of people that joined the church. Acts chapter 2. A known passage, verse 41. I'll wait till you get there. Notice in verse 41, then they that gladly received his word. We're going to go back to this in a little bit were baptized, notice, and the same day, watch this phrase, were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Amen. So notice they added, they were added to the church. Look at verse 47, the last phrase. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So here are people that desired, voluntarily desired, to be identified with that assembly, and we use the term member. Membership. Okay, go to Acts chapter 5, because what's interesting here is we're going to see an example of people who didn't want to join the church at Jerusalem. Do you remember after what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Remember that story? I mean, they were literally struck dead by God. And it brought fear amongst people. It brought fear in the city of Jerusalem. And notice what we find in Acts chapter 5 and verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Look at verse 13. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. You know what that means? In other words, there were people that saw what happened to Ananias and Sapphira and said, boy, it's a serious thing what they're doing. I'm not going to join that assembly. I'm not going to be a member there. I'm not going to be a part of that. It was a little too heavy for them, if you will. So we see an example of some that joined the church in Acts chapter 2, some that didn't want to join the church in Acts chapter 5, and now we'll see another one in Acts chapter 9 that wanted to join the church as well. His name is now Paul. Amen. Paul, after his salvation, what did he want to do? He wanted to join the church at Jerusalem. You say, how do you know that? Well, we won't read the whole thing, but his salvation testimony is recorded in Acts chapter 9. But let's go to verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, look at the phrase, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. 
But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and so forth. So Barnabas says, wait a minute, he's a good guy. That would be like someone coming for church membership and someone saying, hmm, I don't know about this one. He used to persecute the church. I don't, know if, I don't know if we should accept. And someone says, no, he got saved. He gives a good testimony of salvation. And, and, and we say, okay, well, we're going to accept him into the membership. And that's what Paul did. He joined this church. My point is this. So joining a church is biblical. Amen. We see the example of it in the Bible. We see believers becoming, desiring to become members of the church, uniting with and identifying with a local assembly of believers. That is the reality of church membership. It is a Bible doctrine. The and there's a Bible example. Amen. So we see number one. We've got to move. I know you're counting the blanks tonight. The reality of church membership. Number two, let's talk about the requirements of church membership. Go back to Acts chapter 2. It is God's desire for every believer to be a member of a Bible-believing, Christ-honoring local assembly. Amen. That was a good place for an amen right there. It is God's desire. And we see this pattern in Acts chapter 2. Do you know that merely attending a church does not make you a church member? Can I say that again? Some people have that idea. Well, I've been coming here so long, I guess I'm a church member. No, you're not. Amen. Merely attending a church, even if it's, been, if it's been for decades, does not make you a church member. Right. May I also say this, just because someone joins a church does not necessarily mean that they are lifetime members. Right. Right. say, so, wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Hold the bus, let me clarify. <laughs> okay. I've had people call our church telling us that they are members and they haven't attended for decades. I mean, they haven't been here since I've been here and beyond that. And they say, well, I'm a member there. And I'm like, well, who are you? What is your name? If they have not attended for decades, then they may have been members, but they are not members any longer. Do we understand that? Now, according to our Constitution, after, after one year of not attending, if it's not for a legitimate reason, they are off the roll. That's the way it is. Now, if it's a shut-in or a deployment or there's a reason for it, we don't do that. But if it's because they don't come, they are off the roll. And that's the way it ought to be. You see, to be a church member, there are certain biblical requirements uh, to be a member. And there must be, again, a mutual agreement between the one who is joining and the ones that are already members. In other words, when someone wants to join a church, we are, in a sense, entering into a covenant one with another. And we'll talk about that church covenant here in a second, just for a moment here. But what are the requirements for a church member? Well, we find them in Acts chapter 2, maybe I should turn there, in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayer. So here we see the model, if you will, of church membership. We find it here and in other places in the Bible, but in this text we see some definite steps that the first Christians followed. And nowhere in Scripture does this order change. It's the same throughout Scripture. So what are the requirements? Well, there are, I think, four of them. Four of them. Uh, two are going to begin with the letter S, and two are going to begin with the letter A. The first one, letter A, is this. You know what it is. Saved. Amen? Amen. If someone wants to be a member of Capital Baptist Church, or any local New Testament church for that matter, they need to be saved. Born again by the Spirit of God, all New Testament church epistles were addressed to people it was, who were believers, amen. In fact, there is a warning in the Bible to watch out for those who try to creep in unawares and pretend that they're saved and they're not saved. Be careful, church, because the devil would do that. Amen. Absolutely. Right. He'll send in people that are lost Put them in local churches. Why? To disturb the pot, if you will. You say, you're kidding me. No, turn to Acts chapter 20. Why not? Let's go ahead there. I'm moving fast enough tonight. Amen. That's right. I pay these guys to say that. I'm kidding. Don't go looking for me after the service. Right? Verse 29. Acts chapter 20. For I know this, that after my departing, watch this, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, notice, not sparing the flock. 
Be careful they're going to enter in. Uh, and so make sure if someone wants to join the church that they give a clear, clear testimony that they're saved. Amen. I understand we can only do what's humanly possible. I understand that. But they need to be clearly saved as far as we can tell. But that's not the only thing. So number one is saved. Number two, or letter B is this. Write it down. Scripturally baptized. Amen. And I'm going to move through these things. Uh, fo uh, uh, following the salvation experience back in Acts chapter 2, then they that gladly received his word, that salvation, were baptized. Amen. See, baptism is a public profession of our faith. That's what it is. It's, it's what we do. It's the first step of obedience after you're saved. And I won't go through that again, beating that drum again. But it's for believers only, by immersion only. Okay, so they need to be saved and scripturally baptized, and that's it, huh? Nope, there's more. Amen. You say, wait a minute, I thought that's it. No, number three, or letter C, back in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, we read, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So number three, or letter C, is this. Not only saved, not only scripturally baptized, but also agreement in doctrine. You don't join a church, you don't agree with it. You don't join a church if you don't have the same doctrine. If someone doesn't agree with us doctrinally, then they should go find a church that they agree with doctrinally and join it. Because you need to be a church member somewhere. You say, preacher, what if I don't find a church I agree with? Start your own then. I don't know, do something else. Uh, find somewhere else to go. Uh, or, may, or maybe consider that the problem may be you. Hello. Anyway, I won't park on that one. i got to move on here. Uh, but there needs to be agreement in doctrine. No one should come in and join a church to try to change that church. Amen. And God forbid if a pastor changes his doctrine, he shouldn't try to change the church. He should leave that church and go to another place Amen. that agrees with him. Amen. It's not fair to the congregation to change the doctrine and try to impose that on an existing church. Amen. There must be that doctrinal agreement and doctrinal compatibility. Amen. And then there's another one, letter D. Write this down, and that is this. Here it is. Agreed responsibility. Amen. Oh, we're going to hit home now. Look at verse 3. And fear. I'm sorry. Yeah. And all that believe, verse 44, were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Uh, notice there's a responsibility, and a lot of people don't understand this. Yes, you need to be saved. Yes, you need to be scripturally baptized. Yes, there needs to be a dream, agreement uh, in, in doctrine, but there also is an agreed responsibility that you take. Becoming a church member is a serious thing. You say, well, they don't make such a big deal down there at the Methodist church. You're right. Or at the Presbyterian church, you're right. They'll say, oh, come on in. We're, I saw a sign one time. I was passing a church that said, accepting new members. I thought, that is crazy. What are we doing here? But there is agreed responsibilities. Uh, uh, we have, by the way, if you want to know what they are, I'm going to read some of them to you specifically. But you ought to look at it, and I have it uh, cut out like this, at our church covenant. Because we engage to do a lot of things. I'm not going to read it, uh, the whole thing, but family and private devotions, religiously educate our children, seek the salvation of our kindred, circumspectly walk in the world, be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, exemplary in our, exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, excessive anger, abstain from worldly amusements, to be free from all oath-bound secret societies and partnerships with unbelievers, to abstain from the sale or use of tobacco in any form, no cardic, nar narcotic drugs or intoxicating drink as a beverage, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. Amen. Now, that's only part of it. Amen. But understand, that's, that's a covenant. Uh, it's kind of like, in a sense, the Constitution of the United States. In other words, we, we made a covenant as a people, as a nation. Well, as a church, we've done the same thing. Amen. This is what we agree to when we become a church member. And let me give you some examples of them, uh, what we're to do, just to get on the back of your sheet. Uh, here's some of the responsibilities we have as church members. Number one is this, and that is serve the Lord through this church. Amen. Serve him through this church. Why well, do stuff? It's just not with the church. That's the problem. Serve the Lord through the church. Uh, again, you do not become part of a church membership to sit. Amen. Now I understand I'm not talking about physical limitations and so forth. 
there's something everyone can do. Uh, you may be able to teach. You may be able to, to help with something. You, you may be able to go in the nursery or usher or clean or set up tables or, or bus, be a bus worker or, or whatever it may be. That's what part of it being a church member is. Uh, it's you have agreed, I am responsible for this ministry and I am going to serve the Lord through this church. Amen. God forbid if we have to beg people to do something. Isn't that sad? Some people come in and they, they check their religious time card and they go, home, they go home and they think that's all it is to be a church member. That's not all it is. There's a great responsibility here. Amen. And by the way, if you're not a member of this church, and sad to say, you can't serve in this church. Amen. I'm not being mean tonight, am I? I'm not trying to be. It's true though, isn't it? Amen. You can't. You have to be a member. Number two, write this down. Support the work of God, and, and write this a little extra I put in, uh, financially and physically. Amen. You say, how do we do that? Give. Amen. Hey, I, you know, I'm the pastor, but I'm a church member too. I have all these responsibilities too. Amen. That means we're to tithe, we're to give to missions, we're to give to special offerings, we're to give to building repairs. And thank God we have a giving church, I'm thankful. But understand, that's all of our responsibility. Everybody as a church member, uh, you're responsible to be at the, at the meetings, uh, be here for service, amen? amen? That's the responsibility of the church member. Be here when the doors are open. Amen. Am I getting red? No, I'll try a little harder then. We're supposed, supposed to support this ministry. That's what we're to do. Amen. And then number three is this. Write this down. I told you I'd move. Submit to the leadership of the church. Amen. As they follow Christ, by the way, and that's important. I know there's poor leadership in places. I'm not saying follow someone blindly and drink uh, the purple grape juice, if you will, the Kool-Aid, whatever you want to call it. We all have a brain. We understand that. But as that leader is following the Lord Jesus Christ, you should support and follow that leader. That's part of being a church member. Number four is this. Write it down. Stay, I told you it's going to move. Stay away from a lifestyle that is displeasing to the Lord. Do you know that as a, as, as a church member, your testimony is my testimony? Amen. My picture's on the track. Amen. And vice versa, my testimony is your testimony. Imagine if you went somewhere and they, they said, wow, I saw your preacher, boy. He was, he was just raging mad in this restaurant. He didn't get the service he was supposed to get. And man, he was screaming at the top of his lungs. That would be embarrassing. And by the way, I shouldn't be doing that. Why? Because I'm ruining the testimony, not only my own testimony, but this church's testimony and your testimony as well. And by the way, it's vice versa. Amen. If you act that way in a restaurant... It affects my testimony as well, because it's our testimony as a church. Amen. Our testimony reflects the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's supposed to do. So we're to, uh, the responsibility, again, serve the Lord through this church. Support the work of God financially and physically. Three, submit to the leadership of the church. Number four, stay away from a lifestyle that is displeasing to God. And then number five, supplication and support for the members. Pray for the members. Amen. You know, one of the greatest things about being a member of a church is that you become part of a family. Amen. You really do. It's a church family. And when you hurt, I should hurt. When I hurt, you should hurt. When we're going through a difficulty, it should hurt all of us. When there's a need, when there's surgeries uh, the next day, or, or people going through a trial, we should uh, gather together and pray for these people Amen. and love on them and do what we can to help them. Amen. You say, why is that? Because they're a church member. You should be praying for the members of this church, by the way. I'm grateful I hear so many things about praying for me, and I, and I need that. Please pray for me. But we should be praying for one another. Amen. Get a list somewhere if you need it and pray and support them. Give a card. Give a call of encouragement. Uh, the Sunshine Corner, send a note. Do something uh, uh, to help and encourage, to exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's part of being a church member. And then number six is this, also, solve the church problems in a Christ-like manner. Amen. You say, we don't have any problems, so just hang around here. We've, we've been through many valleys here, e even since I've been here. We've been through some deep ones, and thank God, we are a very resilient church. I thank God for that. And perhaps we're up on a little, maybe a little, I hate to even say this now, but maybe on a little bit of a hill here where things seem to be going okay. But just understand, problems are part of life. It's part of the life of a church. And what do we do? We work through those problems together. 
You see, when we had the HVAC issue, it wasn't my problem, it was our problem. I like when people come up and say, Preacher, what are you going to do about this? You, you have a problem. I said, what do you mean you have a problem? We have a problem. You're a member of this church. We have the problem, not me. And so let's figure this thing out. Let's go forward with it. Solve the church problems. When there's people problems, what are we to do? I just read it in the church covenant. We are to solve those problems in a Christ-like manner. Why? Because we're part of the family. We're part of the church member family. My point is this, is there is an understood responsibility when you become a church member. It's not like joining some other club. It's not like a, so signing up for some points club that where you go shopping, where you just got to sit back. It's not like joining some uh, country club where you, where you say, well, I'm going to join here. That means I get certain privileges. No, it's about, yes, there are privileges. I'll talk about that in a second. But there's responsibilities as well. Don't miss the responsibilities. Church member is, membership is more than just getting your name on the list. You know, before I was saved, there were guys that were trying to get into being members of the church. Why? So it looked good on their resume. I'm not kidding you. That's what they did. They thought, you know, it looks like I have a little bit of community interest and this and that. And that's the reason they wanted to join the church. They didn't care about God. They didn't, the ones I knew, they didn't care about those types of things. They thought it was part, it was kind of like, you know, to get on my resume. But it's more than that. That's not what the Bible teaches. Amen. It's more than just that. There is a responsibility. So we see, number one, the reality of church membership. That's what God wants for all of us. Uh, number two, the requirements of church membership. I'm not going to read them all, but you've read them. Saved, scripturally baptized, agreement in doctrine, and agreed responsibility. And then number three is this. Write it down. The reaping of church membership. Now, I told you about the responsibilities. I'm going to tell you about the benefits right now. There are some benefits to being a church member. You say, what are they? Four of them. Number one is this, the power of unity. Do you know that a, a group like ours can do mul a multitude of things greater than one person can do? Amen. You've heard of the, the, the principle of synergy, right? When, when you have two people that have certain strengths, you put those two strengths together, it's actually more than what they could do on each one alone added together. Why is that? It's just the way it works. Well, imagine the synergy in a group like this. I mean, more can be accomplished with a, a, a church uh, together uh, than as individuals. Uh, and again, if you're a member of this church and you're fulfilling your responsibilities, then you are, think about this, you are having a part in everything that's taking place in this ministry. That's the power of unity. We may have the parts broken down to little pieces, Someone bringing in or cooking a meal, someone else working a bus, someone else uh, teaching a Sunday school class, someone else doing this. But you know as a church that we will get rewarded for all of that if we're a part of it? In other words, if you're cooking a meal so that someone can go out soul winning or you, uh, the soul winners come back for, for food or however we do things around or, or whatever, things like that, understand you're going to reap the benefits of that. Because you're enabling the church to move forward, and we can do so much together. I mean, look what we can do with missions this year. I'm amazed. Uh, and praise God. We're already ahead in our faith promise. Amen. Oh, what we can do together. Uh, every soul saved across the mission field. You have a part of that. Why? Because you're a member of Capital Baptist Church. So we see the power of unity. There's another one, and that is this, pastoral care. Do you know, and this may shock some, that the pastor does not have the same responsibility to a non-member than to the member? Amen. Did you know that? Amen. Now, I'm not saying I don't give attention to non-members. I do all the time. But the priority is the member. Amen. Because they're a member. Amen? Amen. And that's very important to understand. As a member of the church, you're going to reap the pastoral staff. You're going to repeat, uh, reap pastoral care. As a member of the church, you're going to reap pastoral teaching and preaching and prayer for you. I pray for the church members, every one of you by name, every week. And I'm not doing that to pat myself on the back. I'm just saying you've made the list because you're a church member. That's why I do it. If you're not a member, I'm sorry. I just have to cut it off somewhere. And that's where it is. Members come first. Doesn't mean I don't love you. Amen. And I wouldn't pray for you. So we see the power of unity. Letter B, pastoral care. Letter C, participation in the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a church ordinance. We're supposed to do it as a church. 
That's the way it's supposed to be done. I don't know about you, but if I weren't a member, every time we had that, I'd feel kind of strange. I just would. Because I'd know that I really need to either, I really need to make up my mind. Am I going to join this church or am I not going to join this church? What am I going to do? Well, maybe tonight God's going to push you in one direction. I don't know. Hopefully to, to join if you're not. But my point is this, again, that's part of the benefits. We gather as a church. We observe the Lord's Supper as a church. That's what we're to do. And that's a benefit of it. And letter D is this, lastly, is this, the pleasing of God. In other words, you are pleasing God by being a member of this church. Amen. Praise the Lord. You are pleasing God. You are a part of what he loves. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You say, preacher, but we have, you know, we have some different people in here. You're right, and there's one speaking to you right now. We're all a little different, aren't we, you know? And we all have personalities. We all have our good points. We all have our bad points. We all have those things that, you know, he's still working on me, amen, amen. right? We all have that. But, but understand, being a part of this assembly, working through those problems, working together, that is pleasing to God because that is amen. part of the Christian amen. life. And the church is what he uses to accomplish his work in this world. Therefore, you are pleasing to him. Number four, and we're done right here. So we saw the reality of church membership, that it's a biblical truth. It's a distinct membership. It is an identifiable group. We saw the requirements of church membership, saved, scripturally baptized, agreement and doctrine, agreed responsibility. We saw the reaping of church membership, and then fourthly and done, and we're done here, and that is this, the result of church membership. Do you know the best results always come when we do things God's way? Amen. Always are. We may think we have a better way of doing it. Some people, well, I think we are. Uh, I've had it with church members. I'm going to do it my way. Uh, it's not going to work as good. Amen. You say, well, I, I can, I'll see somebody say, maybe so, but you won't see what you could if you did it God's way. Amen. You see, here's a, here's a little addition there. I, I think I put it down or down the bottom. Write this down. God's work plus God's way equals God's full blessings. Amen. You see, we are to do God's work, God's way. God's work is the Great Commission. God's way is through the local church. And that is how we get God's full blessing. Amen. You know, I'd like to ask, and I'm going to close with this, I'd like to ask some of those folks like this guy in the beginning of the uh, message that I said, he, he thinks it's not biblical and they're not a member of a local church and they don't believe in church membership. I, I'd like to ask him this. Okay, well, let me ask you this. How many souls do you see saved each week? Amen. Just curious, how many? Amen. How many missionaries do you support? Uh, how many children are you teaching Sunday school to? Amen. Uh, how many believers have you trained to go out into the ministry? How many? Uh, how many buses are you running in your community to pick them up to come to your house? Amen. Probably none. Uh, who are you going to call when you get sick? Or when someone needs to have a funeral taken care of? Or someone's getting married? Who are you going to call? Where do you tithe? Where do you exercise your spiritual gift? Amen. It's supposed to be through the local church. Amen. Uh, and, and when there's a problem with a brother and, uh, and you have to go to him and it doesn't get resolved uh, and you're instructed to tell it to the church, how are you going to do that? Yeah. Right. The truth is, you're not. Amen. You're not. You see, the result of church membership is that God's work is multiplied in this world. My point is this, God's work done God's way. It is abundantly clear from the New Testament that God's way is through the local church and God's desire for every believer is to place their life and influence in a local New Testament church. Amen. And maybe you're here tonight and you're, maybe you're saved and you're, and you're scripturally baptized and, and you haven't joined the church. You know, why, why don't you pray about that tonight? I, I think you got some, some truth tonight. It might help you think about that. But if you are here tonight and you're saved and you're baptized and you're a member of the church, you ought to be thankful. We have a great church. We do. You hear it. Preachers come in here all the time and say that. I've been out preaching in places. Let me tell you something. This is a great church. It's a great spirit, great people. We see souls saved and God is working here and God is blessing us. So don't mess it up. Amen. No, I'm kidding. Let's pray that God continues to bless. Amen. All right, let's pray.